So tell me who's the next to you. There's a hope for you yet. <laughs> There's hope for you. Um, the world of business is a very interesting, is a very interesting place. Um, but there's a reason for it. And uh, as you would know that there's a distinct difference between a Christian owning a business and a kingdom business. Far too often, um, Christians own a business and uh, the underlying philosophy behind their business is to make themselves more comfortable. To build a bigger house, to drive a better car, to have a larger investment and to have uh, a couple more zeros in your bank account. That's the intention. And the intent is primarily selfish. Self-focused, self-indulgent, greed, and extremity. That's basically the heart of it. And most Christians basically try to model their affluence or their comfort by looking at other people, saved or unsaved, who seem to live in the lap of luxury. And that's our definition of success, and not just success, but we more or less define the blessing of the Lord based on material comfort. And I don't know where we got that from. I think material comfort and blessing, that association, has been delivered to us by a westernized concept of the faith. grinds my internal gears because I say again, Jesus did not come to the earth to start a religion called Christianity. And Christianity is not an appropriate term by which we ought to define ourselves. It was an insulting term, a derogatory term by which people were called in the Book of Acts. It was not a statement of compliment. Neither does the word describe that we look so much like the ultimate standard of the Messiah. In other words, when the people used it, they were basically saying, you look like the guy that we basically nailed on a cross. And so, we use the term in the wrong sense. But anyway, um, if we have to define the faith based on a Western definition, we always get entangled in materialism. Because Christianity, based on the American definition, is based on how much money you have, how much comfort, how much comfort you enjoy, and the luxury that we basically are um, engage with from time to time. Even our concept of faith, we say, well, I'm a man of faith because I, I have an idea. I'm a man of faith because I live with so much comfort. And I think we have not really read the book of Hebrews correctly. It said, by faith, men walked around in sheepskin and goatskin, not Italian design clothing. By faith, some lived in caves and dens, not in mansions and penthouses. By faith, some were sawn asunder. By faith, men who lived by faith and who lived by faith in the Bible did not live by a Western definition. Faith is not a commodity that we utilize to be comfortable. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. That is what faith is given for. We don't say, well, by faith, I'm going to get me a new house. By faith, I'm going to get me a new car. By faith, I'm going to buy me a new Dolce and Gabbana suit. And so we have this indulgent, selfish definition of the faith that we have to gravitate, run far from as, far, as quickly as possible, and really embrace a true kingdom standard and kingdom model. This morning, I want us to explore several reasons why God would have given some of us maybe some kind of business acumen why God would have given us ideas, why God would have given us some degree of know-how in terms of starting a business, in terms of entering into a dimension of wealth capture. And so let us talk about, first of all, the, the current landscape. What does the current environment look like? And, um, and um, how are we to configure our operations? I think this morning we have an hour and a half, is it? Um, I'll try my best to kind of um, lock this session into a four-hour kind of session. All right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you want to pick up sarcasm? <laughs> okay. Let's talk about.
by the current landscape and see why it's so beneficial. The spirit of entrepreneurship is being awakened to function beyond previously acceptable capacity across the earth. This is not unique to Kenya, but all across the world. A new spirit of entrepreneurship. And that's, a, that's an interesting word because um, some people are good businessmen in terms of having ideas, but few people are true entrepreneurs. Do you know there's a distinction between having a business idea and being an entrepreneur? Entrepreneurship deals with the actualization, the execution, the literal doing of the thing. Some people have good ideas, but few people can execute it. And so there is a, a very, very, very uh, uh, prevailing environment of entrepreneurship. And I think even within the corridors of the faith, it seems to be a new capture. People are becoming more aware of the possibility that you can engage in business, that you can basically interact with the marketplace, that you no longer have to hide away within the four walls of the church, sing your hallelujahs, and just wait to escape and go to heaven. And I think the more we understand that we are required to occupy until he comes, we are beginning to think a little bit broader, a little bit more expansive. We no longer narrow, we no longer narrow in our views and so on. Um, there are specific drivers that that allowing this new sense of entrepreneurship, and not just a sense of entrepreneurship, but one that is going beyond previous definitions. What are some of these drivers? Number one, the concept of religious schizophrenia is being broken. And that is an ongoing exercise. That that sense that that well, on Sundays we are spiritual and Monday we are secular and the great divide between the two is being removed. And we are beginning to understand that we don't live duplistic lifestyles uh, in this earth, but, but the kingdom is one dynamic, coherent state of existence that goes with you into the madness of your Mondays that lives and operates inside of you in the terribleness of your Tuesdays. It is deep inside of the weirdness of your Wednesdays. It operates deep inside of the turmoils of your Thursdays. And all the freakiness of your, fr of your Fridays. <laughs> the satanicness of your Saturdays. That's not an English word. Satanicness of your Saturdays. And your weird spiritualness of your Sundays. <laughs> It works with you all the time, you understand that? It's always there. What's, what's the drivers? So this is a very important driver. You, you, little do you realize that the more we remove that gap between the spiritual and the secular, is the more people are aware that, listen, I am not involving myself in secular activity when I go to work on a Monday. I am taking the kingdom with me. God continues to work within my heart because spirituality and walking in the faith is not something that is exclusive to a four-walled experience that is only started by a song being sung. And you see, sometimes we try to make our Christian, our businesses a church. So we go, to, we go to our businesses and we think that our Christian business is a Christian business because we start our day's activities with prayer. Or we gather together our employees and we, and we have worship. And we sit together and we pray over our gender. Listen, some people pray over some rare foolishness sometimes. You know? The kind of things we ask God to bless. God himself is in heaven saying, listen, I am incredibly creative. My power is exhaustive. There is no limits to my sovereignty. But I don't think I can invade those dimensions. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I mean, don't work that way all the time. But, but um, there is that um, removal of that duplicity and uh, the religious schizophrenia is being broken and destroyed. The second very important driver that is allowing us to really enter into the marketplace with a greater sense of confidence is that our personal destiny as being connected to God's global purpose in the earth is becoming more obvious, obvious and we are deliberate in saying, yes, we can engage. That we are no longer seeing our personal call, our personal destiny, our personal assignment 
the literal birth that we, that we, how we were ushered into the world, we are becoming very much aware that somebody made a decision to bring us here and we are trying to connect our existence with God's global intent. Every time we gather together as a company, we are trying to become even more intimately aware of the fact that I am here for spite. I am here by design. I am not a mistake. My father was not looking for a nice little sexual experience and oops, I arrived. <laughs> God made a deliberate decision to bring you here. Whatever those circumstances were, you are here by design. And we are trying to connect our existence to God's global purpose and we are becoming even more deliberate in saying, I am here for spite. And that is allowing us to go beyond the fringes of religion and step beyond the parameters of what we previously defined as just church. What are the drivers? We are getting a more firmer grasp of the reality of the kingdom. The kingdom is that dimension of life or that sphere that extends way beyond the borders of religious church. Do you understand that church is not the kingdom? And the more we tighten our grips and the more we become deeply aware of what the kingdom is, we understand that the kingdom is that sphere or that rule of God that extends into all dimensions of life. The kingdom extends into all dimensions of life. It is not limited to a church experience. And if you really touch the kingdom, you are stepping into a broad, vast, boundless dimension where life exists. God rules over all things. Over how many things? All things. And if the kingdom represents the sovereignty, the rule, the uncontested authority of God that is exerted over all things, and we are touching that, then it is our right to involve ourselves in the all things, one of which happens to be business. We ran away from those things because we thought that God wasn't there. And there are many other areas where we thought that God is not there. We sometimes think that if at all we have to involve ourselves in all the dimensions of life, that we have to more or less make it churchy. Solomon had this incredible ability to understand that the kingdom is not limited to the church. Neither is the kingdom limited to a Bible. Solomon says, I passed by the field of a lazy man. He wasn't reading a scripture. He looked upon the field of a lazy man. The field was overgrown, the grass was overgrown, the house was falling apart, and he had wisdom. A little laziness, a little, a little folding of the ant to rest, and then poverty comes upon you like a bandit. He discovered that reality by looking at life. Because Solomon understood that the kingdom of God is exerted over all dimensions of life. And if it exerts itself over all dimensions of life, then all dimensions of life happens to be a classroom and happens to be a sphere over which God can, in fact, extend his rule. Another driver. Number four, God is breaking the smallness of our thinking that has been imposed upon us by the limitations of our culture. And he's joining us to things globally. That you living in Kenya, it's amazing that in, in, there was a time when our sight was limited, limited to the smallest of our culture. And we, if we were imprisoned by our culture. Now, imprisonment is the, can be easily described as being locked within a world where all you see is the limit of that world. And if you live in Kenya and all your gaze is fixed only upon Kenya, you are in a prison cell. The difference between you and a man who is in jail is that your cell is a bit bigger. You can drive in your prison. <laughs> you can go to the grocery in your prison, but it's a prison nonetheless. But now we are living in a time where our gaze are a bit broader. We are seeing things globally. We are no longer living in a limited sphere, that those limits have been removed and we are no longer living in some little small, cultural, little, little pigeonhole. Our gaze has been expanded. And for most people, 
Global is now local, meaning that you live here in Kenya, but all of your definition, all of your concepts, all of your ideas are linked to a vast global world. And even if you have not yet considered the reality, every time you jump on the internet, you are in fact local yet global. And so that is a dynamic. And so people are beginning to understand that there are enormous possibilities. You jump on the phone and you interact on Facebook or social media, and there's algorithms at work connecting you to people who share certain types of ideals without your effort. The system is saying, well, you need to connect with this one. You need to talk to that one. The system reads you and interacts and connects you to a world that's far bigger than what you previously described as local. What is, what is basically feeding this new sense of entrepreneurship? Our involvement, our, our involvement in the marketplace is not corporate. It's not individualistic. We are becoming more aware of that, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that this morning. That our involvement in the marketplace is now dynamically and deliberately corporate, and it's not individualistic, meaning it is not selfish. I can do this, I, or I'm not allowed to do this by myself. Now, if you understand the hostility of the marketplace, the more you understand why it is in your best interest to do this corporately and not try to engage it as an individual. And that's important. The reason why all of us are in this room this morning, it is not because you are trying to get an idea that will allow you as an individual to become more prosperous, but some dynamic principle must be at work that you should say, the person that I'm sharing this table with should become a dynamic part of my own individual process. That we should begin to be deliberate, that we should begin to deliberately interact and interface and intertwine so that we corporately can face the demon of the marketplace with a greater sense of safety, with a greater sense of wisdom, with a greater sense of understanding that is erupting not out of my own personal experience but out of our corporate experience. We are beginning to understand the power of corporateness and that is creating this new sense of entrepreneurship. You all understand me? These are some of the basic drivers. Now there is a need for us to become even more dynamically sensitive to the world and the times in which we exist. So you all understand these, these, these basic um, five principles, right? You all got that. That's simple. Yes. That's not rocket science. Very straightforward. But there is this need for us to become more sensitized to the current environment. But windows of opportunity, windows of opportunity are opening across the world that we must be willing to enter into these areas of opportunities without delay. That we have to be sensitive. We must know that, that my business has the, has the ability, has the capacity that God can put his hand upon what I'm doing, what I'm doing, and, and push that into a world way beyond what I initially considered or dreamed. We have to think that way. We have to, we have to build ideas with that understanding that you are no longer involving yourself in some small, tiny, myopic, let this enrich me and I'll be happy kind of thing. We have to now be very open, be very much aware that God is creating opportunities for us to truly expand and become wealthy. And God is not doing that to make you more comfortable. I want to stress that, that the opportunities that God is making available to us, it is not intended for your personal comfort. Can you say yes to that? Yes. And not just say yes, but can you be convinced of that? That yes. God really is not concerned about your personal comfort. That sounds almost like insulting. <laughs> if God was concerned about our personal comfort, then you know what? He would never nail his son on the cross. He would never turn his gaze away from his disease. Life is not designed for us to tiptoe through the tulips. Life must be confronted with a certain amount of force. And so 
we must become intimately aware of the fact that what I am doing is not designed for my personal ease. If only that statement could resonate and explore within your heart, you will be less selfish, you'll be less stingy, and somehow things will not stick itself to your hands anymore. Because most of us will not be allowed to enter into the realm of riches simply because we do not understand the power of currency. It has to move. It can't stick in your hands. I move. And greed and selfishness corrupts the whole objective. God is opening up, up God is opening opportunities. But the more we see these opportunities as an occasion for personal enrichment, is the more we are prostituting the intent. Right? I'm not one of those who normally say amen, but there are points where I think amen is very much allowed. And there is one. Amen. amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's creating opportunities. And we have to be sensitive to these opportunities. We need to move from a place of planning to a place of deliberate execution. That I want, I mean, it's the time for you to sit with your teams in your business, sit with your financial personnel and sit with your business planners and whomever you have in your office and begin to strategize for movement into new things. Don't just live within the limits of where you started. Think about expansion. This is the time to think about it. I want you to see this as a word from the Lord that this is a time where God is literally creating windows of opportunities for us. So sit and think about expansion. Sit and think about diversification. Sit and think about doing other things. Don't just lock yourself into the initial idea that you had 20 years ago and you're still hammering on that one little idea that you started with 20 years ago. It's a day of opportunity. And so you have to start to move beyond the point of planning and to a place of significant execution. Success cannot be achieved in isolation. There has to be a place of partnership and deliberate widening of our orbits of relationship. You can't do this alone. This is the second time I'm saying this, but I'm saying it in a different way. That you can't engage in the hostility of the marketplace and think that you will survive by your own success. I don't care how strong you are, I don't care how powerful your business ideas may be, I don't care how wonderful your business model may appear to be, if you try to live in that ruthless, savage, hostile environment called the marketplace, it will chew you up and spit you out. And before you know it, one of two things will happen. You'll either be living by its ideals, where Babylon informs you, where corruption is still the underbelly of your operation, or you will be no more. You'll find yourself on the hash, on the ash heap of what once was. Right? You cannot do it alone. Can you tell the person next to you, I need you. I need you. Come on board, join me. Come on board, join me. That's important. That's important. Now, there is a place of kingdom revelation. We still deal with the current environment. There is a place of kingdom revelation that allows us to face risk with faith for the sake of advance. That God is giving us sight, understanding, and He's giving us relationships, and He's giving us um, apostles and prophets who are not just operating within the limited sphere of the church. And that's the reason why I am convinced that almost every move of God, I mean, if you have, I don't know, sometimes I don't know exactly where I said what, but almost every intent that God brought into the earth. We churched it to death. Yep. We literally churched it to death. Because we only saw its relevance in the context of the church. Every move of God was churched to death. Every revival was churched to death. Every season of reformation 
was church to death because we were so myopic. Even many apostles are living in a very limited small sphere because their anointing, their capacity, they only see it within the myopic world of a church. Most prophets, they limit their giftings to prophesying upon a few members in a church. And they don't see themselves as individuals who can literally define the current business environment and give people ideas as to how to face the current trends, how to deal with the current atmosphere, how to relate and interact with the current circumstances of life. Because if you talk to the average prophet, he has to start by speaking in tongues. And I'm not gonna shut up because we have this idea that we have to switch this gift on, you know. The same, the same schizophrenia occurs, you know. And we don't realize it. So here I am as a prophet, and you say, well, can I get a word? Mm. You have to switch it on. And we don't realize that in the normalness of your conversation, you don't have to switch this thing on and switch it off and roll it flows right out of you. So you can sit in a boardroom and have a conversation and have a prophetic conversation without necessarily say, thus saith the Lord. And most people only become sensitive when they hear, thus saith the Lord. Sometimes God is screaming in your ear with a megaphone. And since it does not end with, thus saith the Lord, you don't realize that God has been talking. And again, we still live in that world of schizophrenia. I said, it is being broken. Observe, I did not say it has been broken. <laughs> because prophets have not yet learned to sit inside of a bigger world and speak into the marketplace and speak into the political environment and bring the word of the Lord without giving some minister of government a Pentecostal massage. You shake the man and say, hallelujah, give him it power. We think the power comes from Pentecostal massage. Ah, my best friend, brother. A Pentecostal massage in volume. <laughs> and so, the, 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 there's a place of kingdom revelation. And that allows us to take risks. And I'm upset I said that, you know, we sometimes think that risk is a part of the factor of effective business or life. Listen, you have to engage risk as though you're jumping off a cliff, you know. Even if you choose to jump off a cliff, have a parachute. <laughs> Don't jump like a fool. We sometimes define risk as stupidity and thoughtlessness. In our environment, we are allowed to carry this dynamic component called faith, that we face risk with faith. We face that thing with faith that there is something called advancement and there is advancement with a faith-filled risk that we enter into this with faith. We make investment, having the mind of God to guide us, having the counsel of God to guide us, having friends standing alongside us in the multitude of counsel, there is safety that we can sit, we can design, we can get his mind, and with that understanding, we make the next step, what may appear to be a dark environment, with a greater sense of assurance. So it's faith-filled risk. You follow me? And it's not blind, unaware, empty, jumping off a cliff without a parachute. <laughs> New structures, revelational capacity, and relational orbits are emerging that allow for spiritual seismograph to actually to accurately detect potential volatility and potential stability. Wow. 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 Take some time now, 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 in other words, you don't have to do it alone. The power of relationship, and not just any kind of relationship, because we sometimes think that relationship is all that we need. Listen, you join yourself to the wrong people. 
and you can suffer the consequences. If you want to be wise, then your orbit must be filled with selected kind of people. And so it's not just arbitrary relationships. And so if we are saying that, that, that we are widening our orbits, we don't have to do it alone, then my statement to you is, listen, there are new structures. There, are, there is a revelational capacity. There's genuine relational orbits that are emerging across the world right here in Kenya to which you can connect yourself. And in that world, it has sufficient spiritual seismograph. Men who can detect where the tremors are and where the tremors are not. Wow, yes. wow that's good. Where volatility exists and where it's not. Where fault lines are and where they are not. And even if you choose to build on a fault line, men can tell you how long to build there because volatility is inevitable. Yes. You don't have to do it alone. Again, I don't care how wise you are, it is still woefully inadequate. There's relationships. There's, there's, there's revelational capacity. There's uh, new systems and new structures. And thankfully, these new structures have learned sufficiently by looking at the dysfunctionality of the former structures. That new structures are not there to exercise control over you. I was looking at some, at some notes that I had from years ago, and I'm looking at these notes early this morning, and I say, good God, I taught this nonsense. <laughs> I almost have to apologize to myself <laughs> for having taught that level of stupidity. Where there's this strong emphasis on accountability. Listen, accountability is not complete until it's mutual. If accountability is moving in one direction, then you're living on a plantation. It's incomplete until it's mutual. That you are not there to account yourself to me until I am prepared to account myself to you. And so when we talk about new structures, I'm not talking about new structures that are driven by one directional accountability. We've learned sufficiently from the structures that have been there before. So new structures. Revelational capacity. And that's always expanding because God is always talking. <laughs> and um, I like this, and there's relational orbits. And I'm one of those, I like that term relational orbits because it is my way of trying to, to create language to move away from the distortion of networks. Because most networks have become worse than the denominations that we sought to change. And it still runs on a pyramidic model where one man sits at the top, at the top with a big thorax being basically held up there by skinny spider's legs. <laughs> and those models are still living in what you have heard me say from time to time, the inverse Ephesians 4.12 reality. And so I use things like a relational order. Those things are there. You all understand this? You, have, you don't have to do it alone. Now, our, activ our activity in the earth will attract new levels of satanic assault. I'm still describing the current environment. Our activity in the marketplace will attract a new level of satanic assault. And we have to be aware of that. We have to ready ourselves for it, right? You're going to see this shortly. All the more reason for us to face the future together. Let's say it together. We have to face the future together. We have to face the future together. We have to now hunt in packs. You can't be alone anymore. You have to hunt in packs. If you run out there by yourself as strong as you are, the system will eat you up and spit you out. And as I said, you will find yourself 
either compromising or being a statistic. All the more reason for us to face the future together. Standing alone will reduce you to a cork in a typhoon. You'll be tossed left and right in every direction with no ground, no support, no anchor. You will be a cork in a typhoon. You have to face it together. Is this, is this saying anything to you? Yes. Is this making any sense to you? Now, now, if it's making sense to you, the thing is, most of these principles must have a follow-up reality in them. In other words, what do you do tomorrow? Because you cannot do the Christian thing. The Christian thing is to take principles and lock it into, my, into a myopic form. And what is the myopic form? Hallelujah. Boy, I'm, I'm so blessed. We have to stop living in that boy, I'm so blessed stupidity and start to live inside of a strategic environment. Having heard what do I do? That's good. Mm -hmm. So then I say, okay, I need to sit with two or three of you who are in this meeting. I need to involve you in some of the ideas that I have. I am taking the initiative to include you into my pack. Mm -hmm. But I don't try to hunt by myself anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You see, the... the, the the myopic paradigm is where we get so blessed. Oh, I'm so blessed. And I'm just excited. I am so excited. <laughs> Purpose of God is never run on excitement. <laughs> excitement is what happened when God came down and everybody in Israel said, everything the Lord said to us, we will do. And they did nothing. <laughs> We have a good story at Mount Sinai. God came down, he thundered from Mount Sinai, and everybody said, everything the Lord says to us, we will do, because we are so excited. <laughs> and nothing that they committed themselves to do did they ever do. Because the kingdom of God is not fueled by excitement. Strategic action. Yes. Right? So, the moment you start to affect the devil's resource, you are getting into dangerous territory. We have to ready ourselves for what is to come. Now that is a nice place of encouragement. You have to ready yourself for what is to come. If you touch the devil's gold, you have to ready yourself for what is to come. Because you have to get rid of this little delusional concept of, oh, I'm just going to make myself so rich and I'm going to drive a new car, brother. Hallelujah. And you will know that the Lord is blessing me. You touch the devil's resource, you have to ready yourself for what is to come. You see, the enemy will measure our advance in the marketplace as his loss of resource. In other words, the more you advance, is the more his resources are being depleted. So your involvement in the marketplace is in reality the interface that brings the realization of those scriptures like the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Your involvement in the marketplace is the interface because we always thought that the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just by us paying tithe and praying in a church building. And the Lord will bless me because I need my time. And I hear this little statement of testimony where praise the Lord. I brought my offering yesterday, praise the Lord. And I give my time for the last I had. And I made a big sacrifice, praise God. And I gave all that I had. And you know what? I went to work yesterday morning and I got my electricity bill paid. And the Lord just blessed me. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> See, the interface is not your tithe and offering. What you are doing represents a massive interface that, allow, that allows those scriptures, the wealth of the sinners, the definitely just to be realized. And once you begin to touch the devil's goal, you have to ready yourself for what is to come. Because the devil measures your success by his losses. Every time you gain another shilling, there's losses 
to the king, to, to the devil's gold. Here what the scripture says. Look at this. In Acts chapter 16. This is the New Living Translation. One day, we were going down to the place of prayer and we met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God and they have come to tell us how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated. In other words, he had enough. And somehow, things in the kingdom move when people come to the point where they had enough. Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly, it left her. Her master's hopes of, of wealth were now shattered. Now, do you understand the connection? Her master's hope of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. Now, there are several principles you have to see inside of there. That the success of the apostle was linked to a philosophical position that was alien to what was normal. That these people are teaching that which is illegal for us Nairobians and Kenyans to practice. It ain't consistent with the Kenyan ideal. Are you following me? Yes. It ain't driven by corruption. It's not driven by greed. These men are teaching us principles that are completely alien to our normal. And the thing is, it's ruining our accounts. The spreadsheets not adding up anymore. I have millions now here. I have pennies. So we have to exact punishment upon these guys. Find them, gather them, whip them, throw them in jail. That was their crime. One act, and the devil's resources depend. And the devil is angry, observe the anger of this devil and the anger of these people, it is linked to their money's being touched. I mean, if you can cast out that devil and the money remains untouched, they don't have a problem. <laughs> because his master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, and so they grabbed the poor. The whole city is in an uproar. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. What a powerful statement. They are teaching customs that us Kenyans, it is illegal for us to practice. We make money by corruption. We make money by thievery. Now we are understanding we can make money by relationships, by collaboration, by prophetic ideas, by honesty, by integrity, by truthfulness. That is illegal for us to practice. The mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them to be stripped, beaten with wooden rods. In other words, if you touch the devil's gold, you have to ready yourself for what is to come. And if you read the rest of the story, you'll realize that Paul and Silas were thrown into jail, into the inner sanctum of the prison, and they were not crying and weeping and saying, well, what, what, what brought us here? We don't deserve this. We don't deserve this. We were going to pray. We cast the devil out and here we are. We did good and we are being beaten for it. No. They were in a prison and they were laughing and singing and praising and shouting. The thing caused an eruption. Things changed. I mean, the, the wall fell down. The jailer came and wanted to take them out. I mean, you talk about wonderful madness. Wonderful madness. So when I said ready yourself for what is to come, I'm not, I'm not describing where you ready yourself for a beating. I'm saying ready yourself with internal capacity that even when you are beaten, you know how to respond. I'm not saying ready yourself for a beating. Beating is inevitable. 
ready, ready yourself with a response. When you are thrown in prison, don't point a finger. Have the internal capacity to rejoice even in your state of imprisonment. Even when the system throw you in jail for a crime that you are not worthy of being in prison for. They cast a devil out of a woman and here they are in jail. You understand? When you touch the devil's goal, ready yourself for what is to come. Can you understand that? Ready yourself for what is to come. And remember I said as well that the devil measures your success by his losses. Every penny you gain, every time you put another shilling on your spreadsheet, there is a devil who say, you know what, my wealth has been affected. The master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. You follow me? So, let's talk about money and recovery. So that represents part of the environment. Is that correct? We good with that? We cool? I think we have a question and answer session coming up. Um, let me kind of put this caveat in place early o'clock, right? When it comes to questions and answers that's coming up, don't ask me if a Christian can be possessed by a devil. <laughs> Let's keep our questions specific to the topic at hand, all right? That's a little caveat. And if you ask if a Christian can be possessed by a devil, my response would be, a Christian can have whatever he gets. <laughs> if you get a devil, he gets a devil. All right? Let's talk about money and the covenant. Do to reach out to you. These are, these are scriptures we know. It says, beware, beware that you do not forget, that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I have commanded you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten, and you are satisfied and have built houses and lived in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplied then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery he led you through the great and terrible wilderness and its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, he brought water for you out of the rock of flint. In the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do good for you in the end. Otherwise you may say in your heart, my power and my strength and the strength, sorry, of my hand made me this wealth. But you shall remember, you shall remember. That word remember means to inscribe in such a way that it cannot be erased. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who is giving you the power to make wealth. It is He who is giving you the innovative skills and creative abilities to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Now, we've read that scripture, I'm sure that you know most of the principles inside it. I'll just remind you of some of them, right? One, God has forgotten when his principles are ignored and no longer here to. The forgetting of the Lord is not in your inability to remember scripture. The Lord is forgotten when his principles are ignored or when they are no longer adhered to. Pride is the result of man finding security in the thing other than God. In other words, the moment you build a business and you find security in your spreadsheets, then you have already forgotten. Pride is when you find the greatest security in the car you drive, the house you have, you celebrate the earnings of your business and there you are living in the lap of luxury saying, ah, what good life I enjoy. Deception is when man credits himself for his increase. My own hands have done this. 
My hard work, my diligence, that does not say you should not be diligent and hardworking. But at the end of the day, deception is when man say, I have done this. All wealth comes from God and it is intended for one and only one objective. All wealth comes from God and it's intended for one objective. And that objective is this, what is it to? Establish this covenant. Your money, and that is the distinctiveness of a kingdom business. A Christian owning a business driven by a Western definition of success will always be motivated by selfishness. A kingdom business exists for one purpose, which is to establish his covenant. Why is God allowing you to have money? Why is God creating opportunities for you? Why is God giving you ideas? You sit with your board and you are amazed at the wisdom that pops inside of your meetings and you have to ask the critical question, why? Why is it you are in sessions and meetings such as these where we are describing the expansion of purpose, we are describing geographical reach and entering into nations. Why is that? Your money is not for your personal satisfaction. The day that that principle resounds in your heart is the day your business is about to switch on the next tier of its operation. It ain't for your satisfaction. Running around with your nicely tailored suits, in your nice fancy cars, in your areas of personal ease and comfort, is not the reason why God is giving you wealth. It is the Lord who gave you the power to get wealth so that he will establish his covenant. We have read that time and time and time and time again, but it is important for me to remind you of that. Why are you involved in this dimension of life? Why is it you don't have a call to be an apostle or a prophet? Why is it your call to the marketplace? Because the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers cannot see the realization of their call by depending on tithes and offerings. The tithe and offerings will never make this happen here. This thing has to go beyond a little tithe and offering. And if you understand that, you understand that your giving cannot be limited to a tithe. God's covenant is to empower His people for the full and absolute release and execution of His kingdom in the affairs of man. Why you have money? To fulfill that reality. God's covenant involves a people who is aligned to him and who is radically and systematically engaged in bringing his kingdom to bear on all aspects of life. That is why God called you to the marketplace. Now you realize, in those basic definitions, there's one thread. The one thread is this. That there is a dynamic correlation between man and his relative responsibility to the earth. Man is dynamically connected to his redemptive responsibility to the earth. But God called you to the marketplace in order to underwrite this initiative. <laughs> now that, that is important for us to know that, right? That, that you should not be sitting in effective churches committed to grand objectives and still hoping that men must pray their way into financing these things. We sitting last night talking about interventions into, in, 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 into Liberia. Your heart should have popped and say, I want to finance some of that. You being a businessman, a business professional, your heart should have popped Say, I want to underwrite some of those initiatives. I am prepared to write a check right now to make that happen because this is why I'm here. The saddest thing is when 
People like yourselves, who's involved in the marketplace, are hidden away in churches that are only committed to its own sustainability. Churches that are only concerned about building a large building down the streets and having a wonderful chair, and having wonderful little services, and having nice fancy choirs, but really not committed to taking their redemptive responsibility to the ultimate end. Right? God has given you the power to get wealth that you might finance the establishment of his intent. And so if you sat there this morning and you walked in and tried to figure out well, why is it God is giving me ideas? So we try to dovetail all kind of stuff. God will give you ideas, give you new structures, provide you with, with new spiritual psychology to tell you how to do, what to do, where to invest, how to invest, etc. But all of that is only intended for one intent. Not to deepen your pocket and not to increase the deposits of your cash register. <laughs> this thing is going in one direction. That's God's covenant. Now, listen to this. How much time do we have again? Four. 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 Ah, I like you already. I like you. I like you already. Somebody said four hours. You're my kind of people. Yeah. <laughs> For that, I'm going to have some more coffee. <laughs> Haggai chapter 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea, and also the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and they will come, all nations, all people groups. If this is a New Testament scripture, every single people group on the planet, I will going to shake all nations, all cultures, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory. We sometimes think that glory comes as we sing and worship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that God associates the filling of the house with glory with the wealth of nations. Mm. I will fill this house. All nations shall come, and they will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. And if you thought, well, okay, what wealth is? You can try to spiritualize it and say, well, I get the wealth of nations with the wisdom. No, he was specific. The silver is mine. <laughs> the gold is mine. Let's make it more Kenyan. The shilling is mine. mine. <laughs> <laughs> the silver and gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place, and in this place, I will give peace to the the Lord of hosts. Now, we, we, have to, we have to give the definition of what glory is, because glory is not some halo that gives you goosebumps. <laughs> and that's a very interesting scripture, don't you think? That God associates the glory of the latter house with the movement of resources. The movement of resources. In other words, in other words the present destabilization of the entities is linked to a divine initiative. And have you realized that there is a current destabilization of the three entities? Mm -hmm. Serious shift and massive turmoils and eruptions are taking place all over the world. Um, right now, because of sanctions imposed upon Turkey, their economy is tanking. Mm -hmm. Iran is now lifting a fist in the face of America because of Donald Trump just imposed sanctions upon Turkey and he reneged on promises that former leaders have basically committed themselves to. And the economy across Iran is falling apart. Falling to its knees. America, in their efforts to actually secure their own uh, intelligence, they are putting sanctions upon China, who literally has abused American intelligence over the years. Right? They've taken advantage of America's intellectual property for years. 
Not just only America's IP, but everybody's IP. <laughs> it's true. You go down to you go down to certain parts of China, brother. You can get Nikes <laughs> spelling N E K E. <laughs> they will take anybody's intellectual property and make money off of it. And so all of these sanctions, if there's one thing that I can say I agree with Trump on, he's right, but he's going about it the wrong way. China has enriched itself on the intellectual property of the United States for years. And so he's imposing sanctions upon China. And the result is the American economy is being affected. Farmers are now being subsidized by the government because China refused to buy their soil. And Trump gets out there at the beginning of this month and he says how the economy has literally gone off the scale the first time in over 10 years. What he failed to tell America is that just before these sanctions were imposed, China went into bulk buying. They bought sufficient soybeans and so the economy went sky high. But will it be sustained next month when these farmers realize their soybean ain't being bought? <laughs> the economies are being affected. There's destabilization. And God can use all kinds of people, huh? including Trump, to bring that scripture to the past. So there's this destabilization of the entities and it's linked to divine initiatives. One of those initiatives is to expose the volatility of the systems. God is shaking systems and part of his intent is to show you that the systems of the earth, they are not as stable as they may appear to be. Why is he shaking? To display the stability of divine systems. And systems are not well church versus earthly politics. I'm talking about philosophy that undergird these structures. He's shaking in order to expose the volatility of earthly systems and the stability of divine systems. Now if God wants to showcase the superiority of his systems, then we have to produce it. Because the shaking is intended to showcase the stability of the systems to which we subscribe. But if these systems are hidden away in the four walls of the church, how will the world know that there are alternative systems to their model? More than that, and how would the world know that their systems are just not as secure as they should be when we in the church still believe that our models are just not as impregnable as we think they are and we're constantly leaning on their systems to support us? Are you following me? Because the church over the years has never thought about, you know, let's showcase this model. Instead of running to Babylon and letting Babylon inform our economic policies and decisions, we should tell the world, listen, we have answers for your stupidity. Your gurus are bankrupt, we have ideas. You sit down and look at some of your business shows on television and you listen to these business gurus talk a collection of garbage. You say, well, where is Friday night as well? We have better ideas. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> no, we do have better ideas. Amen means let's agree on that one. If we have superior systems, we have to showcase it. All the more reason we cannot continue to subscribe to church as we know it. We have to build atypical models, models that are not consistent with the norm. We have to build and we have to showcase the superiority of our, of our models by building systems that are built on powerful creativity, innovativeness, prophetic correctness, executive ability, and religious free thinking. Good God, that is important. Religious free thinking. Here is a quote from a, from a guy I know all too well. I see it in the mirror every day. Religion is a disease, yet it pretends to be the cure. <laughs> Religion is a disease, yet it pretends to be the cure. We have to build more.
models that are free of this religious nonsense. Listen, I keep saying it, that it is the Christian's kryptonite. Mm. Nothing weakens us and cuts us down and neutralizes us and makes us look pity petty and puerile and dysfunctional and irrelevant more than religion. You got that? Religion is a disease, yet it pretends to be the cure. You are following me? Yes. We are blessed with right? Yes. Now, now the production of, the producing of superior systems begins with a deliberate deference to kingdom standards. We have to move more towards that. Superior systems require less dependence on the prevailing ones. You have to come out of Babylon. Exit that one. Superior systems require the collaboration and unification of those who espouse the kingdom as their ultimate and only standard. That we have to begin to really come together, pool our energies, enter into genuine collaborativeness. That superior systems require the collaboration, the unification, creating new orbits of relationship with those who espouse the kingdom as their ultimate and only standard. Superior systems require the absolute commitment to operate contrary to the obvious warped and prevailing norm. But you have to be prepared to say, I'm gonna build a model that is not fueled by the current normal. Because it is superior. Clear? Is that okay? All right, now, the glory of the latter house is inextricably linked to the transfer of the nation's wealth. We saw that, the movement of wealth. But remember that over the years, we quoted these scriptures and said things like, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, but we had no interface to realize that. And we were the fools who kept saying it, pronouncing it, Declaring it, confessing it, but we had no system to execute it. Because the true model really was every Monday morning, the banker, the unsaved banker, was saying the wealth of the Christian is laid up for us heathens. <laughs> because the largest bank deposits around the world in Christian circles occur every Monday when the treasurer of the church takes the offerings of the people into the coffers of the heathen. And so the heathen quoted the scripture in an inverse way. All oh, the wealth of those Christians are laid up for us heathens. We could build another concrete jungle, have new buildings, take your money, and give it to the guy down the street to do stuff with it, we make money off of your investment. We never thought about building cooperatives and having banks of our own and all that kind of stuff. So we had a, we had a really build models where that transfer of wealth becomes a reality. Zerubbabel's temple will lead the wealth of the nations for its completion. You call Zerubbabel's temple, the latter house, the latter house, in the book of Haggai is literally Zerubbabel's temple. And so if we describe Zerubbabel's temple, we are describing this latter house, or put it this way, this present house. It's no longer latter, it's now this present house. But when we talk about the completion of the temple, we are not describing the completion of a physical structure, but we are describing the execution of our earthly responsibilities. Right? Now that's important. Because we did connect your finances to God's covenant already. Now let's explore this thing just a little bit further. And let's um, look at this. There was a small city with a few men in it. And a great king came to it, surrounded it and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man. Good God. That's where most of us find ourselves, you know. Most of us live right here, 
And I know so many people like that. Wise, but poor. There, there was found in that city a poor, wise man who delivered the city by his wisdom. But no one remembered that poor man. So Solomon concluded and he said, wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised and his words are not heeded. You stand in nations and territories and you can point a finger and tell political leaders what to do, how to do, and they despise you. Because their question is, where have you done this before? And while you have the ideas, you don't have the resources to execute it. While you have the wisdom, you don't have the resources to leverage it. Wise but poor. Wise but poor. What do we learn from that? Eh? The poor man's wisdom is rejected by the systems of the earth. The poor man's wisdom possesses transformative capacity, but it lacks the legacy component. He delivered the city by the wisdom. The city was delivered. The man's wisdom has transformative capacity, but nobody remembered him. No legacy component to it. Generations came up and did not even acknowledge that in years gone by, a wise man, oh, thank you very much, brother. You're a man of God. <laughs> Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. <laughs> that, is your, that is your husband. Made a good choice. <laughs> You're a man of God. Ah. Good. Where, where were we before we were Google interrupted? The legacy component is the, is the sense of continuity. Generations after did not acknowledge the transformative capacity of that poor man's wisdom. And um, the thing about wealth and wisdom is that it it switches on that legacy dimension. So the poor man's wisdom has transformative capacity but lacks a legacy component. The rich man's stupidity is most often seen as intelligence. Hence the reason you find these unintelligent gurus on television talking about where the economy must be directed. He lives in this environment a rich man's stupidity. And all of these politicians are shaking their head because he's a rich man but stupid. Why teach him? What do you call it? Why teach Why teach him? A rich man's father is often seen as intelligent. You know why? Because he has the resources to build models. As wrong and as warped as they are, people can see, well, okay, he did that, and he did that, and he did that. Rich, but unintelligent, but at least he has something to show for what he possesses. We need to build systems. Listen to this. All of that I read that started my principle. We need to build systems that will put wealth in the hand of the wise. I'll say it again. We need to build systems to put wealth in the hand of the wise to give traction and give velocity to his wisdom. The poor man's wisdom have, it has transformative capacity. Nobody listens to it. He shows up on television with his tattered clothing and the world is driven by optics. You show there, you show up there, they don't have the, 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 the suit that they would submit to. You don't have the certificate that they would submit to. And so they dismiss you. We need to build systems and models that will put wealth in the hand of the wise. Here's a question. Why did God put you in the marketplace? To put wealth in the hand of the wise. <laughs> so that his wisdom can gain traction 
and philosophy in the earth. It has many wise men who are poor. I know a man driving an Uber to survive, to feed his family. Wise, but poor. I know a man doing landscaping in Italy to feed his family. Wise, but poor. I know a man who has to send letters out every single month asking for donations to pay his mortgage. Wise, but poor. And then Christians with their millions are sitting in their nice little plush palaces talking about how blessed we are. Oh, I'm so blessed. The Lord blessed me. No, the Lord blessed you so that you could put wealth in the hand of the wise. Are you understanding? So that his wisdom can continue to exert transformative capacity. Why is the poor? Listen to this. It's a remarkable scripture. And I'm going to stop with this. I'm going to try to behave myself. Can we do that? Right? Here's a good scripture. Yes, sir. 30 minutes. 3 0. Good. I like that. You're my kind of guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You all are very fortunate to have a man like him right here who gives me 30 minutes. <laughs> Here's a good scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Now you have to read all of Second Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul is describing the movement of resource. Those who have contributed to those who don't. And the generosity of one community is basic, basically taking care of the lack of another. And those are values that we have to be, that we have to make a reality. Now, if we understand the dynamics of equality, equalization, parity, that that nobody should be living in a world of lack when we are all here. God built economies like the Jewish economy in such a way that there really was not supposed to be a poor man. And so Paul is utilizing that whole concept of the movement of resource, what I call a commonwealth, and that's a nice word. There is a commonwealth that Paul is speaking into where the resources of one is helping the lack of another. And inside of that world, he says this in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 9. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Are we talking about a scripture verse before picking up an offering? <laughs> We quote the scripture, hallelujah, praise God. I want to talk to you today. Uh -huh. <laughs> About giving a uh heart. -huh. The Bible said, praise God. Uh -huh. If you sow sparingly, uh -huh, you will reap sparingly. Uh -huh. And I want you to bring those baskets and dig into your coffers, praise the Lord. Uh -huh. And I want you to put a couple of zeros. Uh -huh. <laughs> Paul is not putting the scripture as a precursor for collecting an offering. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I say, he who sows sparingly will also reach sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. But that each one gives as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, I love this, listen. Mm. God is able to make all grace abound to you. Mm. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good will. Now, I want you all to read with me only the bold and underlined parts in that verse. Always, stop. how often? How regularly? Always. Not on occasion, where there's a hiccup or a spasm, where last year around December we were able to, but we couldn't do it in February and March. Always having how much? All, all sufficiency in how many things? In all things. 
Now we have to associate all things as all the right godly kingdom driven things here, right? We have to kind of be, be specific. And I love this part. Now let's read the latter part. And have an abundance for every good work. And then Paul underscores, or remember, when Paul said this, this was in the scripture. Remember that, we sometimes ignore that. That when Paul got up and said, you hallelujah, you know, he who so sparingly must also reap sparingly. That wasn't the Bible. That was an apostle giving doctrine and providing context and giving definition for people's thoughts. And then he had to back up those ideas by quoting the Bible. And then I mean, eventually, it all became part of the Bible. But this wasn't the Bible. Paul is giving ideas, giving context, giving definition, providing doctrine. And then he supports this by saying, as it is written. Now he uses the Bible to support his philosophy. As it is written, he has dispersed the broad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, which part of this scripture says all of that? <laughs> there is something called abundance when we the book. So let's see something here, right? Now, there is sufficient for so many bad work. You know, I look at guys who they come on television and they talk about they have five Rolls Royce. Pastoring a church of 2,000, five Rolls Royce. That is what I call sufficient for every bad work. <laughs> you have two private jets. You have one local church. You live in a world of self-indulgence. You have really no motivation to exert the redemptive power of God across the earth. Some of them will never find themselves in the Congo. You know why? It has no offerings there. They will never find themselves in Mali, in Burkina Faso. You will never hear of these big preachers. If this message is real, then how is it you don't hear about them in Nepal? Or Pakistan. Yeah, you hear about them down in Cape Town in South Africa, in London, England, because in those areas they will continue to have sufficient for all their bad work. <laughs> it has sufficient for all kind of bad work. Why so many good works are being aborted? being compromised, are constantly being amended and adjusted because of lack. Men with big, big visions have to amend their vision because they don't have the resources to finance their dreams. And so they are always amending, amending. Well, our intention was to uh, build an orphanage and build a school and build a hospital and Put some public toilets down in Liberia, but um, <laughs> praise God, you know, um, that was a good idea. Um, <laughs> you know, we just do some conferences, praise God. <laughs> you have to amend your whole intent because you don't have sufficient for a good work. Why so many bad works have sufficient? <laughs> so many good works have to be aborted have to be compromised, have to be amended because of lack. Again, remember, I'm connecting the dots here. We read Ecclesiastes and we understand why we have money and why God has us in the marketplace. Why God, why God puts us in the marketplace? Because we have to put wealth into the hand of the wise. Now we understand that, listen, God's intent is that there will be sufficient for every good work. That is the revelation intent. The reality is not yet lining up with the revelation. And so we have to create the dynamic that will allow revelation and reality to become one. And how do we do that? We have to build systems to address the current deficiency for so many bad, so many good words. We have to create the context. What is that context? It's right here. 
You have to create a context where good works will have sufficient. Why are you here? You are here to create the appropriate context where good works will have sufficient. Kind of quiet in this Presbyterian church this morning, I hear you. Are you quiet? I hear you, man. Give me a little amen or something. I want a little encouragement. Amen. You know, I, I like to stroke my ego a little bit. And I ain't getting enough attention because there's so much hard work and I require to. Come on, give my amen at least now. Amen. Let the go. <laughs> I feel so good now. <laughs> now listen, Paul, Paul validated that whole principle. Paul validates and he connects this sufficiency for every good work by reading a scripture. Again, let me remind you of it. And God will make all grace abound towards you. That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work, as it is written. So this idea is now validated by this scripture. And that is written in Psalm 112 and verse 9. He has dispersed the God, he has given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. Now let's go back to that scripture and see whether that really speaks to what Paul is talking about. So let's go back to Psalm 112. And let's put, the, I'm gonna pick just a few scriptures out. Just a few. This is the first one. Verse 1 to 4. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Somehow we didn't align this thing. Somehow I'm missing out some things down there. Who delights greatly in his commandment? His descendants will be mighty in the earth. The generation, now look at the old areas, the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Now Paul referred to this scripture to validate that philosophy. And that whole scripture deals with principles consistent with Paul, with what Paul is identifying. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness will endure. What's the principle? Not the enduring, the enduring capacity of his righteousness versus the poor man whose wisdom is forgotten. Observe the enduring capacity of righteousness that is attached to wealth and riches. The legacy component. You understand that? The poor man is wise, but poor. He delivers the city. Generations after him forget him. Here's a rich man. His righteousness endures. Are you following me? Let's look at another scripture. Verses 4 and 5. Unto the upright, there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious, full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. Now this lens is just nice Old Testament, old Bible language for giving. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. What's the principle? The upright is characterized as radiant and illuminous in the midst of prevailing darkness. The upright arises is light arising in the darkness. He is described as radiant and illuminous in the midst of darkness, which really is an oppositional force in an environment of prevailing distortion. He arises, as, he arises as light in the darkness. Light in the darkness, an oppositional component inside of a prevailing environment. The second thing that Paul says, the good man is defined as generous. A good man, well, a good man deals graciously and he lends. He is defined as generous. And one who handles his affairs with discretion. The word discretion is the, is the Hebrew word mishpah. It means according to law, with 
proper rectitude. In other words, he ain't corrupt. He's not underhanded. A good man, he guides his discretion according to principles, rule. He ain't, he ain't, he ain't taking bribes. Right? Next scripture, verse 9 and 10. He has, we have King James here. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. Now, this is just nice Bible language to describe. He's not hoarding. He has dispersed. He is not hoarding. He is not looking at his abides not to come every month and just celebrating the zeros. <laughs> and that's what most business people do. They celebrate the zeros as an indicator of how blessed they are. You know? We define blessing based on assets and based on liquidity. So you look at your zeros. But this man don't live like that. He has dispersed. He's not holding. He dispersed. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. The wicked will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. Now, that's what Paul is not doing. Paul quoted this verse to justify the point he was making earlier in terms of sufficient for every work. He said, as it is written, he has dispersed, he has given to the poor. The point is, generosity has a militaristic dimension attached to it. He has given to the poor, look at this. The wicked shall see it, grieve, gnash his teeth, melt away, his desires perish. Mm. Now, that is not born out of you praying in him. That's born out of you giving. There's a militaristic component. Because remember I said earlier, every time you increase, the economy of the enemy is decreasing. He measures your increase by his lack. So when you increase and you disperse abroad and you give to the poor and you lend towards a good work and you put wisdom in the hand of the wise, and you give towards the acceleration of God's covenant intent, you are engaging in high voltage warfare. Because you are not church. Your area of spiritual assault and spiritual warfare is not by kneeling down and lifting your hands and confronting in the name of Jesus. Your warfare is exercised by investment. You understand? Yeah. You write a check and give it towards your leaders and say, put this into this initiative. Put this into that initiative. Here is sufficient for that radio station. Here is enough for that orphanage. Here is enough for this particular seminar. Let me underwrite the course of this initiative. You are allowing the enemy's intent to melt away. You understand? You write a check and devils are shaking it's like, good God. No, the devil would say good God. That, that just don't go together. Because <laughs> <laughs> your, your warfare is like, you take that pen out and you begin to put that check and devils understand warfare is taking place. What are you doing? Listen, you are causing his desires to melt away. Generosity has a militaristic component attached. God didn't bring you here to make you selfish. If God has given you ideas to get wealth, it is not designed for that money to stick into your hands. Every time you take God's resources and you, in, and you invest in your own comfort, stability, and you put the agenda of the Lord on second base, you are basically saying, my own energy has given me this wealth. He gave you the power to get wealth so that he would establish that you would establish his covenant. So his covenant would be established. A kingdom business lives in that reality. That you don't hold it, it's person. 
Now understand that we're not being reckless, right? I'm not describing recklessness. Investments. He has dispersed. Point is generosity has a militaristic dimension. You all get that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the wicked grieves, is infuriated, diminishes in strength, and ultimately sees his oppositional intents. That a team is saying. Ultimately sees his oppositional intents neutralized because of the generosity of the righteous. We sometimes think that we bring the devil's intent to nothing by praying. <laughs> Do you understand this? His intentions are neutralized by generosity. And that's what Paul is after in Corinthians. He said, you know what? You have given to their lack. You have taken from your abundance and invested in the lack of another. And so we have sufficient for every good work just as it is written. And Paul pulled from this verse to amplify a philosophy that has since become Bible. Right? I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop right there. Has this made any sense to you this morning? Has this made any sense? Yes. Has it confused you? Does it insult you? Okay. It's your holy principles and allow these principles that these guide some of the decisions that you make as a business professional, as a kingdom businessman. All these principles. Too many good, wise men are living in a place of lack. We need, to put, we need to put wealth in the hand of the wise so that every good work will have sufficient. Right? Yes. yes. Hey, let God, let me ask the Lord to bless, bless you, businessmen, that God will just smile upon you. Father, your word says that you give us the power to get wealth. Yes. Lord, this is a conversation that is unique to this company, and we make it specific to this gathering. Because right here, are men that you have put your hand upon to enrich them and bless them and open their eyes and give them business acumen, give them the incredible capacity to take faith-filled risk in ways that I would not be able to do it, in ways that most of the broad sect of the church will not be prepared to do it. But God, here we have men who are have been involved in this, they've been schooled, they've been trained, and they have experience. Some don't have experience, but God, you have put your hand upon them, and we can't deny the fact that you put your hand upon them in order for them to attract certain dimensions of wealth that the average person won't be able to attract. What might look like an enormous sum of money for me, it is just small change for some here, because God, you have given them the capacity to live in a realm of, of, of wealth but that wealth has been given so that it could finance the advance of your cause. And so we connect those dots. And Father, now we have a basis to pray that you will bless these men, that you will enrich them, that you will enlarge them, that you'll give them capacity, you'll give them even more creative and witty ideas, you'll give them inventiveness, you'll, see, you'll, you'll give them pathways that, in which they can take their businesses, you'll give them tributaries of the spirit that they can move into that is far bigger, far broader, far wider than the deposits and the areas in which they currently exist. Lord, expand them in every, which in every rich and dynamic way. And God, we ask this not in an arbitrary, selfish it's intent. We ask this because you have, you God, you have a covenant that you want established across the earth. A covenant that we subscribe to, that we give our energies to, that we give our lives to. But God, we are asking that you will Bless these men, these women, that they will contribute financially to see the realization of the dreams that you place inside of Charles, in, in, inside of Ken, inside of the men of God in this meeting, inside of all of us, God. That God, the things that you call us to do, we won't be sitting around scratching our heads and wondering how we could amend and adjust the bigness of our dreams because of the abundance of lack. Help us, God, to do this right. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.